Hello everyone, this is Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Webinars. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today, Insurance and Treasury, the Why and the How. Uh, a little bit about the background for this webinar. I'm always trying to stay on top of my game so I can help you stay on top of your game. And I started to notice a lot of great content from an organization um, called Complex Countries. So they have a wealth of information. Uh, much of it is focused on doing business and everything related to risk, payments, everything you need to know about doing business internationally. So there's an amazing um, amount of content there. And so I was looking for ways that I could partner uh, with the organization to share uh, some of the great research um, that they're putting out. They have uh, conversations, interactive conversations with global treasurers, huge companies, and sharing things that we should all be thinking about uh, in today's world. So that's kind of uh, kind of the background here. The other thing I want to share is that I used to manage, help manage treasury way back in the day, probably 2005, and I was out looking for resources. I went to the normal suspects, all the associations. I found absolutely nothing. It actually terrified me a little bit. So I know this is a topic uh, of great interest uh, to you, and it should be. And so uh, I'm thrilled and I'm hoping that uh, we can partner with uh, complex countries uh, to help us out there. Uh, Damien, uh, and I want to welcome my speaker first briefly. Um, Damien, I um, hope I don't do your last name uh, too bad. Uh, Clint Denning, he, uh, he, is, uh, he is one of the key, key officers at complex countries. Can you give us a little bit about what you guys do at complex countries, Damien? Sure, with pleasure. And Ernie, thanks. And uh... Thanks to everybody for joining, and Ernie, again, thank you for the kind words about complex countries. Uh, it's very much an organization where we get treasurers to talk about things that are of interest to treasurers, so um, uh, hopefully we always manage to stay relevant, stay relevant because it's very much what people people discuss what they want to discuss. Uh, by the way, the name is Glenn Dinning, so it's Damien Glenn Dinning. Um, who am I? The answer is, uh, for 13 years until 2018, I was the uh, group treasurer of Lenovo. Uh, I was based in Singapore, even though it's a Chinese company and the official headquarters were in Hong Kong, uh, I was in Singapore. Before that, I spent 21 years with a small computer company called IBM. Um, I joined them in the European headquarters in Paris, in France, and spent time uh, in Ireland, Singapore, the UK, and New York. Uh, so, you know, Everybody says that IBM stands for I've been moved, and certainly in my case, uh, that was absolutely true. Um, I, I did various things in IBM, including internal audit accounting, uh, but I did spend the last uh, 12 or 13 years in Treasury, where I was tangentially involved in uh, insurance. It was never my primary responsibility, uh, but I saw that it could be very interesting. and. Um, when uh, Lenovo bought IBM's PC business and found themselves with me as a treasurer as a result, um, I ended up managing uh, insurance. I was happy to do so. It was something uh, which I always found fascinating you know, when we talk about the strategic treasurer. This is a case where you really get to influence strategy, where you get to sort of, you're not running a full PL, but you're you know, you're making economic decisions and living with the consequences. But also we talk a lot about the treasurer as the risk manager. And this is where you really see risk management at work because you have to manage the trade-offs. So I have found it absolutely fascinating. Um, I take it from the fact that people are on this call that they're also interested and hopefully we can uh, share some of the enthusiasm and uh, some of the many, many lessons I learned. Uh, thank you so much, Damien. And so with that, I'm sure you're all now, as, as I am, I'm honored and humbled to have Damien on the call today. So if you have any questions, please ask your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel in the questions area. If we don't get to your questions, I'll coordinate. Um, with Damien, this is a tremendous opportunity for you um, to have someone that has knowledge that in my mind is priceless if you have any role in managing insurance. Before we really dive in, um, I'm gonna hit you up with a couple polling questions um, so I can give Damien a little bit of a landscape here um, in terms of the involvement um, of my audience here, um, in terms uh, of insurance. So let me go ahead and launch our first polling question here, just trying to get a sense of you're characterizing your knowledge. Uh, we're not gonna tell on you if you don't have a lot of knowledge here. 
uh, nothing wrong with that. So if you can take a minute to answer that polling question, that would be amazing. Don't want to leave the polling question up too long because we've got a lot of ground to cover here. We want to make the best use of our time uh, with Damien. So I'm going to go ahead and just give it another uh, few seconds here. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a, a quick peek again. Um, this is for, for myself and Damien to help us drive this conversation and make sure that we're, we might we might be getting in the weeds a little bit too much uh, if you're not deep in insurance. So we want to make sure that we don't do that. So give you a couple more seconds. All right, let's, let's see what we got here. Uh, Damien, so uh, we got a, a pretty good mix here. We've got um, 68 of, of percent of folks decent. Well, we still have 30 percent that's kind of minimal, 18 um, percent good and 15 percent responsible for it. And so I will try and keep that in mind um, as we go through the webinar here. So let's thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and hit you up with another polling question. Sorry, it'll get better. Um, no polling questions. Well, I want you to share with us how insurance is managed in your company. Uh, so while you're doing that, I'd like to give an overview of the agenda. So we're going to hit as many topics as we can get to. We're going to start off with a question that could be its own webinar in itself and many more. Does insurance belong in Treasury? We'll hit that and we'll talk about the value of captives. We'll hit the value of insurance brokers. We'll talk about right sizing insurance. We'll give a few thoughts on cyber in insurance. And then we'll talk uh, a, a lot, a little bit about uh, the overall landscape of risk management and why that's uh, very important um, for the strategic treasurer. So let me go ahead, give you guys a few more seconds here. We had more votes, more poll response last time. So let's everyone take a second, um, just hit the button. If you're interested in receiving a certificate of insurance, certificate of insurance, see, I love insurance, certificate of attendance for today's webinar, you need to answer all the polling questions. Go ahead and close that. So let's go ahead uh, and share. Uh, interesting. So it looks like we have 40% in Treasury, right? 28% risk management department. Um, so, Damien, um, any thoughts here? I mean, we have a U.S.-centric audience here, but is 40% higher than you expected, or is it about what you expected? Any thoughts here? Um, I find it moderately encouraging. Um, right. The yeah. one comment I would make is that people can only make one choice. So I was very interested on the first question right. about how many people are in charge of insurance but have minimal knowledge, because we come across people like that who are in that situation. Um, and I suspect um, in many cases that the insurance is actually split. You know, one of the problems is that in many oh, right, cases right. there is no single responsibility. Right. Yeah, right. So it might be managed in silos in a sense, which is yeah. uh, dangerous. All right. So, well, so let's get into it here. <laughs> so, so here we go. So you kind of shared this a little bit, but I, I'd like to get a little more color. Um, what are your thoughts on why you think insurance is not managed in Treasury in general? Um, I think the real problem, to be honest, is that my, and my view, and maybe I'm slightly jaundiced on, based on my experience, but my view is that most corporates don't really manage insurance, or at least don't manage it as well as I think they should. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about risk management, but when you really run risk management, uh, I know I'm not the only person who's been somewhat disappointed by the reaction of the business and general management. So I think very often the question is, do companies really look at insurance as something that needs to be managed as a whole, or do they say, oh, well, I need uh, employer's liability insurance, or I need insurance for, I need health insurance. Now, health insurance typically will go into HR. Uh, employer's liability will often actually wind up in legal. Um, and you can see there's good reasons for that. Uh, but then you end up with the question of saying, well, yes, but uh, we have, we've got these different silos reaching out often to the same providers or reaching out to different providers and not getting the economies of scale. So for me, it's often a question of saying that you've got different people who've decided to buy insurance at different points in time and nobody's really thought about it holistically. Right. And just just my take on, on that question, just being very engaged in the Treasury community and with all the folks in our audience, I, uh, to me, it just feels like um, th there's so many other things going on in Treasury. Treasury is trying to become 
uh, more strategic. And if I did surveys about what they're responsible for, right, um, risk was part of it, but then I asked them how success is measured, and that's not even uh, in the equation. So I think we have a problem with, it, it's the treasury folks themselves that don't think that it's important enough to be a priority in, in my mind. And so that kind of tees up my next question. And what I'll do in general for the audience, um, I'll ask Damien a question and then let him share his knowledge. Of course, I have some takeaways for you, right, on the slides. So just be patient. Um, you'll, you'll get some content. Of course, we want you to listen again. So Damien, um, I, I know my answer to this question is, is aligns with yours. Can you share with us, uh, one thing is to help folks, right, in Treasury, help convince themselves and maybe the CFO, why, do, why does insurance really belong in Treasury? Well, again, as you go back to the previous thing, it's always going to be a mixture because you know, you're going to be buying insurance for different um, branches of the company, you know, buying insurance for HR and for other people. So it's it always has to be a team effort. And that's, by the way, a very good test for the, for the treasurer. But for me, it really comes down to if we view the treasurer as the risk manager for the company. And I think there's a lot of very good reasons for taking that view. Now, you know, there are other views that can be defended and um, it's not unimaginable that a company would take a different view and put it somewhere else. But, you know, as a, as a treasurer, we're already looking at various kinds of financial risk, various kinds of e economic risk, uh, you know, the risks of control over the trading activities and so on and so forth. So for me, it's simply another branch of managing risk. And also, I would say going in, fitting in with that, and this gets into some very contentious discussions that I used to have. Um, as a risk manager, you end up with having to decide whether you want to go for a short term benefit, which will help the current quarter, or whether you think it's important to do something which will maybe bring value in the longer term. And in my experience, usually treasury is the function within finance, which is the probably less switched into the quarterly results grind than the others. And I do think something like insurance here, because obviously one thing that happens when you're responsible for insurance is that you get the controller who calls up and says, I've got a problem for the quarter, I need you to stop buying insurance. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think it is important to have somebody who is maybe not going to go along with that request every time right um kind of a, another thing that 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 uh, you and i have touched on and i think sometimes in treasury we don't realize how unique our view is of the whole company right and all the operations so we really have the network we really have the visibility and so a lot of it if you're in silos you're not aware of all the risk exposures right and there's relationships and we're involved maybe in the m a strategy and how the business models uh, might change. And so I think we already uh, have, have that network. Um, anything else you wanna kind of add along those lines from your perspective? Well, yes, and thanks for putting up the chart because there's a couple of other things in there yeah. which I think are very pertinent. So one of them, and again, I don't know how it is in every company, but a lot of companies these days, the treasurer gets to regularly talk to the board of directors or at least the audit committee. They're usually very interested in what the treasurer thinks about risk. So again, for me, one of the key things is that the treasurer in many cases has a conduit both to the board of directors and often through work, you know, when you're doing roadshows and so on, you often get to talk to the investors um, and the people who are buying the company's debt and equity. Uh, so again, I think that gives you a very a balance and a, and a network and, a, and an overview which not everybody has. Uh, the other thing which is mentioned on this chart, and I think it's very important, I don't know whether everybody does it, but certainly one thing that we went through in Lenovo was a very theoretical exercise, but it's still worth doing in terms of saying, well, what is the amount of risk we're prepared to take? In other words, what would we view as being an unacceptable loss in a given quarter? So again, that comes back to the whole question of the quarterly earnings grind. But I think it is very important to have a discussion up front, which is to say, what can you accept and what can you not accept? And I think that it's very theoretical, but it does at least kind of put a, put a stake in the ground. 
Great, thanks. So, so let me kind of fl flip the other side of it and talk about uh, why people might feel that Treasury does not belong at Treasury. And so uh, my first question is around, I have a loaded perspective on this. So I don't know if I shared this with you already. If I did, I apologize, but it was shocking to me. Um, when I went out and looked for content on managing insurance and treasury, wanted to make sure I was on top of my game. What did I find? Absolutely nothing. It, it shocked me. And so I don't know if you have a good answer to this, but I guess as a treasurer, I would my brain would be like, okay, how do I make sure that I gain and maintain the expertise to manage treasury? So where would folks look other than the people like yourself to to make sure they get that expertise? Is it another organization? Is it RIMS? Any advice there? Uh, to, by the way, it's a good question, but the same applies to every other um, organization. I mean, if HR is going to manage it, where are HR going to learn how to do this? Exactly. And yeah. Same applies to legal. So uh, I'd be interested if you found anything saying how to manage corporate insurance, I suspect, irrespective of the function it's in. And I suspect the answer is you didn't. Now, I view myself as being very lucky because you know, within IBM, uh, insurance was managed by a very good friend and a guy who, who I worked for a, very, for a very long time. So he was always happy to share his knowledge. But frankly, at the end of the day, for me, one of the benefits of managing insurance was the amount I learned. And I learned a lot basically from the brokers, actually. And we're going to get on to talking about brokers. That's a very uh, difficult discussion, uh, but they are also, uh, whatever you, else you say about them, they are a huge source of knowledge. Okay, and they, and they, it's in their interest to educate the trade because it's, it can get very difficult for them when they're talking to somebody who doesn't understand. Right, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely um, get to that, that part. But for me, uh, when I worked in corporate treasury, we managed insurance. There was some content out there, but uh, our insurance broker was invaluable. Uh, for us especially, we did a lot of uh, acquisitions. And so ha having that insurance broker help us understand the coverages that we had versus the coverages that the acquired company had and how those policies would fit together and those risks that we were inheriting uh, were crucial. Now, if you were to go out and try and get knowledge, I think the knowledge is siloed by the specific lines of coverage that you're looking at. So I might be able to find something uh, on DNO and I might be able to find something on cyber, but I can't find right how to how to manage it, how to put it together, uh, and also uh, how to benchmark uh, those rates as well. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so let's shift yeah, to- we'll Come back to this discussion. Right. Only, only just one question. I yeah. learned a huge amount from our <laughs> Yeah. Because you, know, you get to see from the inside how somebody else does it, and sometimes it's, hey, that's a good idea, and sometimes it's, well, right. I'm glad we didn't do that. <laughs> you learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. So let's do this. I like to do things when they make sense. So let's go ahead and and let's let let's make sure that we talk about uh, insurance brokers, right? So I'm going to go ahead and launch a polling question here real quick, uh, out of order, of course. Uh, but just to see if what the audience's experience is with that, just because it's a natural, I like to have a natural flow to the conversation. So I shame on me for not putting it um, in the right place. So please share with me if you are using um, an insurance broker, uh, and then we'll go ahead and have a conversation around that. Uh, and then we will pivot to the next topic that I have uh, that makes sense in the flow um, of our conversation. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. Good response. Thank you so much. And then we'll take a quick peek uh, and then we'll get back and dive in uh, a little bit about the value of an insurance broker and then some of the things that you need to be careful of like anything else uh, when you're entrusting your uh, your risk management to an outside source. Let's go ahead and close that. Thank you. And then we'll go ahead and share. Uh, I think I'm a little surprised. I'm happy. Um, so 74% of the folks say they're using an insurance broker. Um, those of you that don't know, you know, I'm going to say it. You should find out because <laughs> I think we need to be on top of these things uh, in Treasury. Uh, is that result about what you expected or a little higher in terms of using brokers, Damien? To be honest, I don't, didn't know what to expect. I'm reassured that 74% do. Um, 
kind of concern about the 20% who don't, but I suspect they're probably not involved in insurance. Sure. Okay, so I know you touched on this. Can you give us just a little more color around what you see as the value um, of, let's say, a good insurance broker first? Well, let's talk about the negatives first, because I okay. think it's important right. to get them out of the way. The yeah. first one is, as in every business uh, relationship, it needs to be somebody with somebody you can trust and somebody you do trust. Now, unfortunately, the industry has set a bad example over the past few years with cases where brokers were behaving very badly. Um, and of course, the fact that the industry has gone through significant concentration means that the you may, don't have anything like the choice you used to have. So uh, the big problem is that the broker is in a position to abuse your trust if, the, if he or she chooses to do so. And that's something that you've got to be aware of. Uh, that doesn't mean to say you can't trust them, but it does kind of raise issues. And the other, which is something that I addressed early on in Lenovo is that in many cases the brokers are remunerated through a commission on the uh, premiums that you pay right. and that obviously creates a uh, conflict of interest because in that case it's, it's not really in their interest to help you reduce your premiums. Um, so there are things just wrong in the setup. Um, having said that uh, and while clearly there have been some bad apples, um, I've, I've got a, an address full of insurance brokers of whom I have the highest opinion people that I trust. Um, obviously, you need to know where they're coming from and what's going on, but um, I think there's, you know, there are very, very trustworthy people in the industry. Unfortunately, there's been abuse, um, but there are people who do earn your respect. Now, to get to why do I think you do it, the answer is, thank you for putting up the chart. If you look at the different lines of insurance that you're buying, um, you know, if you're running a large, uh, the insurance function in a large multinational company, you're buying something in the region of 10 to 15 different major lines of insurance. And, you know, you're, these are going to be effective or in effect in anything up to 150 or 200 countries. For you to have the knowledge of all the markets and all the T's and C's and all the peculiar peculiarities that go along with that, and each of the markets is different, each of the lines is different, has different characteristics, uh, and they evolve over time. Frankly, the knowledge that you would need to have to manage that yourself uh, would make, A, it would be full-time job, and B, by the way, if you actually had all that knowledge, you'd be much better off being a broker yourself because brokers make a lot more money than treasurers. So, uh, frankly, if you look at the breadth and depth of the knowledge you need to get, um, it is impractical unless you've got a very large insurance department, it's impractical to even think of doing that. Apart from anything else, it's very time consuming because one of the services that the brokers do is to go through, for each of your lines of insurance, they go through talking to all of the insurers, you know, to all of the carriers, they advise on the trends and they will do an RFP for you, you know, the organized competitive bids. If you just think about the amount of time that you and your team would have to devote to doing that, because I remember just going through the results of this used to be a two-week exercise for us. Um, if you're trying to do that yourself, you're going to end up with a very big department. It might be cheaper than paying the broker, but um, you're going to end up spending half your life negotiating with the controller and the CFO about why you need such a big team. So for me, it's just a technical, it's a very technical area. There's a huge amount of knowledge and you're dealing with a huge number of insurance carriers, uh, so many regulations, trying to keep on top of it in my mind, trying to keep on top of it yourself is just not going to happen. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let me share. Um, these issues are still the same um, from when I was helping manage insurance. It was actually my boss, a treasurer. So we were fortunate enough. We found um, an amazing broker. Uh, we always battled right with the CFO about how much we were paying her. So we actually paid her like a flat, flat rate, tried to take all the commission side out of it for her. She coordinated meetings with us and we wanted to talk 
to the carriers, right? So we would go up to Chubb, talk to Chubb, talk to those people. She got us access to all those people managing claims. That's invaluable, right? Um, we have manufacturing company. We had a claim. I can't tell you how many days and hours and years I would have wasted if she wouldn't have helped uh, walk me through the process, right? It has to be a trusted person. And then there's the good ones. There's ancillary benefits, right? We didn't have in our contract help us get our risk policies together. And so the other question that comes up, which Damien kind of touched on was, why don't we hire someone to do insurance? And Damien gave the succinct answer, uh, you're not gonna get that person, right? If they're that good, they should be a broker. So so those are just kind of some of the things um, that I was on. Is there anything that I said, Damien, that kind of had a couple things that made you think about, you know, specific value that a broker may have had for you, maybe helping you get in sprinkler systems or something like that? Uh, well, I think we're going to get onto that when we talk about risk management, because yeah. for me, the broker uh, is a big help in risk management. Right. Uh, but I do think it's important to, as you've said, uh, the the other thing which you, which we've discussed but isn't on the, I think is on the chart here somewhere is uh, the other problem when you have the regular discussion with the CFO about why in the heck am I paying so much in uh, in premiums. Um, is benchmarking because yeah. again the fact that they advise other companies means that they can tell you what kind of programs obviously they sort of uh, ma ma uh, manage the data so you can't identify too easily uh, who the other companies are but they can go around and tell you what other people in similar industries or different industries are buying um and what's the thought process behind it and kind of you know they can give you a view as to where you are on average in terms of pricing so that's another very important thing that they a very important uh, benefit they provide is benchmarking yeah one other thing that came to my mind was um our our uh, broker was a guest at our quarterly board meetings and so that was our mm -hmm. conduit of resources to make sure for the cfo to make sure that, that the company was on top of our risk right, risk profiles, so they would bring her in. She was amazing, and without her, I don't know what would have happened. I, I think it helped the CFO sleep. I know it helped the treasurer sleep before the board meeting. So you got to be yeah. Have the right and, and by the way, the other thing, the other thing which is important here is that a lot depends on the signals that the broker gives. But if the broker has somebody very senior who is clearly very interested and motivated, that also sends a very good message. Right. All right. So we, we talk, we're talking about insurance. So another way to mitigate risk uh, is, uh, can be a delightful, it can be a, uh, a uh, interesting area. Uh, so let me go ahead and make sure I get the right polling question here. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, let's get into the captives a little bit. I'm just asking you to share with me, please be honest. Do you use a captive? No, you know and you won't, or you don't know, or you might not know what a captive is if you're not uh, involved in insurance. We'll take a quick peek at that, uh, and then we'll go ahead and do some high level, um, high level uh, questions, right? Real briefly about captives, what they are, the whys and the why nots, uh, and, then, and then, we'll, then we'll transition a little bit um, to talk about, um, as Damien said, you're, you might, you're, you're and in, in, in anything you're doing, you're, you're accepting a level of risk. So we'll talk about the concept of self-insurance. Maybe we'll touch on a couple lines um, where that makes sense. And then we'll we'll wrap things up with a discussion on risk management. So let's go ahead, close that for everyone. Let's go ahead and take a quick um, peek um, at the results. Uh, not too many. So we had 74 use a broker. Um, we had 19% uh, use a captive. Uh, no, no one you don't. Know don't know and what is a captive so we've got probably 40 uh 40 percent of the folks which are not all that uh familiar and so let's start there uh Damien can you give us just to start a brief view of what a captive is yeah it's very simple it's your own insurance company <laughs> so uh instead of going out to the market with all of your insurance policies you set up your own insurance company usually in a tax-friendly environment, uh, you know, the biggest place is Bermuda. Uh, I suspect a lot of that's got to do with the, the fact that you then have to go there for board meetings, which somehow seems to happen on a Friday. But um, 
and it's usually in a low tax jurisdiction um, and basically what happens is that all of the companies in the group buy their insurance from this company and this company then by, by doing that you've centralized all the risk into one place and this company will then go out and place the uh, insurance of the group in the market so instead of having 150 different subsidiaries going to the market in their own names uh, you'll have this captive which will go into the market in the name of the group that's that simple yeah well not, let now, me ask the, what is the benefit go, on. Yeah. Go, on. go ahead sorry so you're going to ask a question <laughs> yeah no let me uh, i know people are thinking this because i was thinking a little bit about it back when we did captives so just to give a little bit more color not too deep so there are other companies in the captive right and it, it could be wrong correct me we're pooling risk together so how do you may how do you manage or uh, make sure you're getting in a captive with the right type of companies okay well there you're raising um a much more complex structure so right. for me the simplest version is right. it's your own captive and it only okay. deals with your own risk got it and you know there are some there are some jurisdictions for example which will only allow um a single a captive that manages the group risk it will not allow third parties uh, once you start getting into i mean clearly you do especially that works for bigger companies for smaller companies you do have these structures which involve uh, more than one company um well, i'll be honest i have no experience of that because you're between ibm and Lenovo. i never really worked for a small company right. but um the it, it does become very very complicated because of course as long as it's your own company as long as it's your own group uh, you don't have to worry about how you share uh, risk and losses and premiums across the different uh, participants. Uh, once you get into a multi-group captive, those become issues. So Ernie, maybe you'd like to talk about that. You obviously know a lot more than I do. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I actually, sorry, I, I don't get to talk about insurance. I don't think I've talked about it in 10 years, so I got a little excited. So. So, so I'll, I'll leave that conversation for people that are more versed than me. That's just something that you might come across in an acquisition. So an acquisition may be involved in a captive. So you got to be very careful about captives. And so I'll let you, the expert Damien, um, get back to giving us some great insights on the why and the why not. Well, I don't know whether I'm an expert, but if I am, it's only on uh, single group captives, uh, which are much simpler. Um, and by the way, if you come, if you have a single group captive and you come across, you do an M&A and you buy somebody who's involved in a multi-group one, then my recommendation would be you pull them out of that and pull them straight oh, yeah. into your <laughs> own captive. Yeah. So my, um, so what are the benefits? Um, now a lot of the time, because these are set up in uh, low tax jurisdictions, there are some tax benefits. But frankly, these days. Even at the height of doing this, for me, the tax benefits were never that big. Uh, yes, I do know some people who are happy because you get the tax deduction quicker for losses than you would do otherwise. Um, but frankly, if you're doing it for tax, I think you're doing it for the wrong reason. For me, the main thing is that what it does is that it centralizes all of your risk. You know where all the risks are simply because you're writing all the policies. <laughs> um, you, know, you know what you've written, you know what there is. and the other, th what it then enables you to do is to decide, because for me, one of the key things in managing insurance is that you have to make a decision about which risk you keep and which risk you offset by buying policies in the market. Uh, that's always a difficult decision and a captive doesn't provide you with the answer, but it does give you a much better visibility into the data uh, to enable you to do these things. Now, the other big benefit, and it's one which um, Obviously, the accountants try very hard to nullify because, in theory, if it's 100% earned subsidiary, it should become invisible on consolidation. But the reality is that you can actually end up building up reserves, uh, which means, you know, so if you're going to be carrying a lot of self insurance, which of course helps you save on the premium, uh, that's great until you get a big loss and everybody gets very upset. Now, if you manage to build up a reserve which you can use 
which you could use to release uh, to offset at least a part of that loss um, then that helps you smooth things a lot so basically the idea is that the overall view of insurance of corporate insurance is that you carry as much deductible as you think makes sense um, in exchange for the reduction in premium that you get and the captive gives you a much better view of how you do all of that now i had some long-term views which i never managed to realize but for me the long-term dream was also to use the captive to offset risks across different lines now that of, of exposure that gets very complex but at the end of the day that for me would be nirvana now we've gone through the list of objections because a lot of people complain about the cost my view is that the cost is actually not necessarily that great especially if you you know it's usually a service which is provided by your broker most of the brokers will run a um a captive for you and generally the risk isn't you know the the cost isn't that hard usually and again it depends on the on the jurisdiction uh, but usually many jurisdictions require you to have a registered insurance member a registered insurance broker or you know, a professional anyway so that's provided by the broker right uh, so a lot of the objections that people usually come across are just ones that i frankly don't agree with but but yeah, it, there is obviously a cost. There is obviously, you, know, you do have a subsidiary and if you're on the board of the subsidiary, you have to be careful to make sure that right. you don't get to, you don't have to expose yourself personally. Right, all right, let's let's kind of, I think the natural the natural uh, point here is we, we actually have a, a, couple, a couple questions here, which I'm glad to see, keep the questions coming, um, is around this idea of self-insurance and uh, right sizing uh, self-insurance. So when you're not, when you're not, you know, when your deductible is going up and down, you are essentially choosing um, how much of that risk um, to take on. So my life in treasury, um, we were, I would say self-insured up to a point um, for medical and workers comp lines. So can you give us just a sense? I don't know if it's anything more to be added on what it means to be self-insured. Oh, um, be careful because if you get me going on this, I will carry on for a very long time. Um, because for me, it's one of the key decisions that the company has to make, and that's where I think that's why I think it's a huge opportunity for the treasurer to add value. So the way I look at this is that there's two extremes. For me, one extreme is what's quaintly referred to as marine cargo. Uh, yeah. which basically involves shipping and it doesn't matter if you're shipping by uh, you know a 747 is a is a ship as far as the insurers are concerned um, but basically if you go back to the Lenovo business or the IBM uh, business certainly for the things like PCs when IBM made them you're shipping something like 60 million items of goods across national boundaries uh, year in year out and these are ones that are desirable that people like to lose they're also uh, like to steal they're also quite fragile they can get broken quite easily so whether you like it or not no matter what you do there is going to be a certain level of loss every year genuine breakage theft and all sorts of um, even ship sinking and that kind of thing so let's say that on average you're going to be losing 10 million bucks a year on marine cargo i stuff getting lost in transit if you go and buy an insurance policy, guess what the premium is going to be? It's going to be the $10 million of losses that everybody knows is going to happen, plus the insurer's profit, plus the admin cost of managing that. So buying insurance with a first loss makes no sense at all in that situation. In fact, there is a term for it. It's called trading dollars. In other words, I give you a dollar, you give me back a dollar. Um, so that's a very clear case where it makes no sense to buy insurance for the full amount now what you end up doing is say okay i know i'm going to lose 10 million year in year out some years it'll be 15 some years it'll be 25 maybe even a couple of years it'll be seven or eight so you then say well okay what is the amount over and above my 10 million that i'm prepared to risk so what you'll say is well if i get a really bad year when i'm going to lose 40 million well i want to make sure i'm protected against that so i'll say buy maybe insurance above 25 or 30. 
So those, that's a very, very simple case where it makes no sense to buy first dollar loss. Right. Um, and you need to take a view as to what what is the level of loss that you can absorb. The other extreme is, for example, when you're talking about property insurance and business interruption, um, you know, how often does you, how often does your main factory burn down? Well, hopefully never. But you still want to buy insurance just in case. So that's a case where you'll sort of take a different view and say, well, this could cost me $2 billion in terms of lost business and so on. So how much am I prepared to lose there? You'll come up with a very different answer to the one you've come up with on marine cargo. But basically, you're looking at saying, OK, um, there it might, in the case of the factory burning down, it might actually make sense to buy first loss. Um, but it might not. So really, this is where it's, the art comes in, and it's an art, not a science, because you get into a trade-off which says, OK, if I have a big deductible, and self-insurance is basically either not buying insurance at all or having a big deductible, the higher the deductible, the less the premium I pay. So you're in a very difficult trade-off. And as I said, it's an art, it's not a science. And I would love to give people a good answer as to how you make that decision. I'm afraid I can't. But for me, the very simple thing is, if you look back over the, this ceased to be the case in the past two or three years, but if you look back over the past 15 or 20 years, the insurance markets were soft. Yeah. In other words, the cost of cover was very low. So if somebody's going to give you cover and not charge you very much, then you'd be silly not to take advantage. Now the markets are hardening, have hardened, and they're hardening more. So as the premium gets higher, that's when the trade-off, you know, the trade-off, as we know, a trade-off is kind of a, a continuum. And the higher the premium, the more the needle will move to the right. Right. Let me kind of jump in here. Something that I kind of want to bring up. I know we can have a conversation about this for hours, but it, it's important to understand if you've never been involved in insurance, uh, insurance that you can have an impact on what your premium is. So you have to do all these applications and things. So especially if you're looking at property, you want to you want to make sure that your plant managers understand that and you give them good information because that gives you a, a better tool, right, as a trade-off. Now, when the markets are soft, right, it might be, you might be able to tolerate that, but when the premiums are tightening right now, um, you wanna make sure that you put the time and effort into, ask, into giving the broker, if you have a broker, everything that they need and being honest with them, because th those premiums can move up and down quite a bit based on the current state of your company. What are your, did you have issues with that, Damien, or did you have a, process set up to get the information you needed for your renewal times. No, and, I, and this kind of gets us into probably the next topic anyway, which is risk management. Yeah. Um, because yes, there's many factors come into how much your premium is going to be. One of them is your loss history yeah. or how, how bad a risk the insurer thinks you are. If the insurer thinks you're a good risk, they'll give you a better price than if they think you're a bad risk. I mean, we all know that from our car insurance. You know, if you have to, if you have 10 crashes in a year, you'll probably find your premium's gonna go up. Right, okay, any, let, let's, we're gonna, let's transition to risk management first, and then if we have time, we can delve into cyber insurance a bit, but I know risk management is extremely important and t topic you wanna give give some time to. So is there anything on the why not here um, that you want to touch on before we pivot to risk management? No, I think um, it's, it, this is really where you add value. And that's one of the reasons why I think right. it belongs in treasury. Okay. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and pivot here. Uh, so again, if we don't get to cyber insurance, you if you want a co copy of the slides which have the key takeaways there, please Ernie at treasurywebinars.com, Ernie at treasurywebinars.com. Also questions in the questions area. And so um, so let me go ahead and um, just kind of turn the floor over to you um, and let you lead the conversation um, in terms of the risk management discussion. And I'll ask you questions as they come up from the audience or my mind as you, as you drive us through this topic. 
Yeah, well, thanks, because, um, you know, again, we all talk about the treasurer as the risk manager. And when you actually start getting into um, these, the discussions around risk management, uh, that's when you start to understand a lot about how the business really views risk. Uh, and some of the strangest discussions I've had and some of the stupidest things I've heard senior management say have been related to this. And I, and I, use, I choose my words carefully. I have heard some really stupid comments from senior managers, including one who said, why am I buying risk insurance for in case the factory burns down? Because they never burn down. And I said, but you know, your own you own your house, right? He said, yes. I said, has it ever burned down? He said, no. I said, but you still buy fire insurance in case it does, right? <laughs> you know? uh, but I've honestly had this discussion. Um, so the biggest issue, of course, is what you get to in the when you're dealing with the business and especially with the budget people is they and I've had the comment but we want our policy should be that we only buy insurance if we get more backing claims than we pay in premiums think about that one for a minute I've had that comment several times and earlier have you ever had that comment uh yes uh, unfortunately yes well I think my Sorry, I think we had a it. Uh, my uh, my favorite um, comment on that one, kind of a little off tangent. I have to share my story. Um, we had a C CFO who liked to fly his plane and take board members on it. I'll let that sink in for a moment on you. So those are the kind of <laughs> things I dealt with. It wouldn't tell me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so sorry. Well, Go ahead. Well, exactly. So. So. Again, if you think about it, you know, what is the business model for insurance companies if they always pay out more in claims than they collect in, in premium? It's probably not a great business. <laughs> um, so, you know, people misunderstand the function of insurance. The function of insurance is to say, well, you know, we hope you don't have an accident, but if we do, you know, we will provide you with financial compensation. And that's one thing that many people misunderstand. And that's something that the insurers were very quick to point out to me, which is, yes, if your factory burns down, we will pay a claim which will include a business interruption element. But while your factory is down, you're going to be losing business to your competitors. And when the factory comes back again, you're going to have a tough time getting that business yeah. back. So, an insurance policy helps you with the financial consequences, but it doesn't fix the business. So basically, the big thing with insurance is it shouldn't take your eye off the fact that it's much better not to have an accident. And the number of times I and so I used to regularly invite the insurers in to come and review what we were doing from a risk point of view and say, well, here's your because they're <laughs> they're very motivated to help you understand what your risk profile is, what you can do to improve it, and where you're doing things badly. And the resistance I used to get from the business was, yes, all they're doing is trying to avoid paying claims. And the answer is, well, yes, you're right, that is what they're doing. But it's also based on the fact that, A, the less claims we make, the lower the premiums will be. But more importantly, uh, do you really want to burn the factory down just so that you can get the pleasure of claiming on the insurance? I suspect not. So. It really does come down to saying, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding. It's just like your car insurance. Do you stop buying car insurance just because you don't have an accident? Of course you don't. You want to make sure that you don't have accidents. You want to make sure that your factories don't burn down. You want to make sure that people don't get grievously injured on your, when they're on your premises. Um, and the better you are at doing this, the lower your premium will be, but that you, know, you still want to make sure that you have the cover. Um, and then where this gets into all sorts of really interesting discussions is uh, the better insurance company, in fact, I think nearly all the property insurers now provide a service where they, they'll go around and look at your buildings and the main reaction, the main uh, recommendation they'll always come back with is you should install fire sprinklers. Reason for that being simply uh, that a fire, if it's put out within the first 10 or 20 seconds, 
will cause very little damage at all. Once it's kind of got a hold, it's going to be much harder to to put it out. Fire sprinklers are very good at putting fires out very quickly. Factory management and you know, facilities management hate installing them, especially once the building's been done. <laughs> and I know only you got involved in some really weird discussions about this too, right? Yeah, we had a we bought a company. This is a true story. The guy was selling fireworks in the plant out of the back of the plant. So imagine that conversation. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and again, by the way, often the insurers don't help themselves because uh, we did an M and We bought a piece of we bought a, a company which had a factory in Japan. And I read the report, and they said the walls are covered in a wall covering uh, which has, which we consider to be unsafe because if it catches fire and the fire reaches a temperature of 180 degrees centigrade, the flame will spread at a rate of 240 meters a second. So 240 meters a second. You're telling me this is a bomb? And they said, yes, it's basically petroleum jelly. <laughs> It's a bit like as if you if you paint the walls of your house with gasoline. Yeah. Um, go on. You know something that comes up. Sorry to interrupt. Was, and I don't know if this is still going on, but a great point, especially if you're uh, looking. Maybe you have an opportunity. You're looking to, I don't know, in this environment. But we did. We switched our manufacturing to different countries. So that's a really good time to have your insurance broker involved in the construction. Um, of the building itself so the fire sprinklers get in so you can mitigate um, the risk uh, on that side of it in relationships with your plant managers are crucial uh, they're not going to want to pay right they don't want to come off their bottom line you should try and find a way with the accounting people to make that not hurt their bonus or what they're judged on because it's important and try and work with them and make sure you're doing everything possible to mitigate the disruption in the manufacturing that's really important yeah, and I do have some sympathy because you know, once the factory has been built, installing the fire sprinklers, yeah. sprinklers afterwards often means you have to stop production. Uh, but you're absolutely right. But one of the other problems that you do get once you start doing um, cross-border activity is you do get the answer that um, you know, the, the insurer will take a look and say the, there are sprinklers, but they don't meet the technical standards that we think are a minimum. And of course, the answer comes back that they meet our national standards. <laughs> that gets you into some very difficult discussions. All right. Okay. Um, but, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Let, let's. Um, we've probably got about five minutes left. So, if you would, um, please um, give me some. You know, any comments you want on risk management, and then we'll just real quickly. Um, touch on maybe just one or two things in the cyber side, um, then we'll wrap things up. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. So again, I think just to sum up, we all sit here and say, well, of course, I want to have fire, fire sprinklers in my factories. Of course, I want to make sure I've got a GPS tracker in the trucks if the trucks are carrying valuable shipments. Of course, I want to do everything I, I can to reduce the risk. But in practice, if you go to somebody who's a, a factory manager or you know, uh, the site manager and say, I think your risk management precautions are not good enough, uh, it's typically not a good discussion. And then, of course, you get into, yes, now you want me to take my valuable CapEx budget, which I'm planning on using to buy new machines that produce stuff better and quicker. You want me instead to use that to buy fire sprinklers. So it's a very difficult discussion, but it is a very important one because A, it is best, let me repeat, it's best not to have an accident. And even if you do get your money back, you still have substantial disruption to the business. And again, uh, don't forget there are also questions of personal safety. So I view this as being very important and it's a big challenge because you find there is resistance that I still found surprising at the end after many years of doing this. So let's move on to moving on quickly to cyber insurance. Um, I have to admit that uh, you know, I retired in 2018. The reason I'm not working here, not not treasure anymore, is that I retired. Um, and cyber insurance was a big topic, and it was very much an emerging area. I think it still is. 
Um, the big issue that I found with cyber insurance was, first of all, again, you come back to the question of before a company will give you cover, they tend to want to know what your internal processes and procedures are to avoid having an accident. And that can get you involved in some very um, difficult discussions with the IT guys and with the legal guys. Uh, important discussions to have, but not easy. Then the other is that, in fact, when you get underneath all the hype, and there is a lot of hype, uh, most more, most cyber claims tend to actually be very small. So if you, you know, there's a large number of claims, but for small amounts. And typically they're amounts that most companies can absorb. Uh, coming back to the whole question of to what extent you sell for sure versus uh, buying cover. The real problem is that you can get some very, very large claims. Um, you know, once you start getting into the five, six hundred million or a billion dollar uh, claim, uh, then it tends to be very difficult. It's not impossible, but it tends to be very ex difficult and expensive to find that kind of cover. So my view is that this is something which will sort itself over time. Uh, you know, insurance is a numbers game is based on the probability of losses. Uh, insurance carriers today don't really certainly four years ago they didn't have sufficient experience to be able to actually accurately evaluate the risk and therefore give you a reasonable premium over time obviously that is improving and will continue to improve uh, but for me it's still an area where you know they've been insuring factories against uh, fire for two three hundred years they've been handling cyber insurance for maybe yeah. five or ten and there's still a lot of experience to be built up yeah, my my just add on would be that from what I hear, um, people in the cyber security space, cyber insurance space, is a lot of the policies out there are written to avoid the risk, so you're not really mitigating the risk that's most important. So that's where expertise in this area. But this is an area where there's a lot more out there um, in terms of research and media, so you probably have a little better chance here, uh, you know, educating yourself uh, in that sense. So before we I'll wrap things up uh, to put a fine point Damien thank you so much for your but I'm going to have to ask you um, just as a as a good way to put a point on the, the discussion uh, just r remind us all um, uh, as a treasury professional as a strategic treasurer um, why do I want insurance and treasury can you give us the the kind of the two or three the sales pitch for people to want to do it and be motivated mm -hmm. to take it on well, the reason you don't want to tell the CFO is it's great fun, it's very interesting, <laughs> you learn a lot, um, and you get to meet some great people. And you know, my view was that every time I did so, every time I had a meeting, I came out a little less dumb than I was was when I went in. Uh, so it does you a lot of good, and as you can tell, I I loved it, I enjoyed it, and I learned so much. But for me, it's also a question of saying. If you believe in the strategic treasurer, we'll talk about it. For me, this is one of the areas where you can really make a difference because, you know, at the end of the day, nobody's going to say FX doesn't belong in treasury. Nobody's going to say managing bank debt doesn't belong in treasury. Um, and that's what we kind of are paid to do. Uh, and it's very important and we learn a lot from it and we add a lot of value. But this is an area where we can take the view the approach to risk, the understanding of risk in the context of the company and in the context of the markets and the broader economy, and we can apply those same principles to saying, hey, there's some really complex trade-offs here. Come back to the question of self-insurance versus buying cover. It's a trade-off. Where do we situate the company on that trade-off? And I think the number of people who are well equipped to answer that question is not very high and I certainly think the treasurer is one of them and again if you go through the discussion we've been having you're talking to HR you're talking to legal you're talking to IT you're talking to the logistics guy you're talking to the manufacturing guys the um, the treasurer already has all of those relationships so we're among the few people in the company who have the network and the relationships bring to bear to bring all of these things together so those are the reasons why i believe it belongs in treasury um but really at the end of the day it's called it's fun 
All right, uh, thank you so much. So as they wrap things up, Damien, uh, first and foremost, thank you so much. Um, honor and a privilege to have you today. Amazing conversation. So I know you're busy, so I appreciate your time. Much appreciated as well. Thank you from all of us here. Uh, and then also want to thank Complex Countries again. If you have, sorry, if you have operations in other countries, suppliers, you need to go to complexcountries.com. Believe me, you will be amazed, amazing content. So sorry, Damien, thank you so much for, for joining us. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. And all, as always, everyone, uh, until next time, uh, make the rest of your day great, everyone.